Good morning, campers, and today I would like to talk to you about koans. Usually when people use the word koan these days, they're referring to a certain tradition within Zen in which a teacher gives a student a kind of crazy question and the student is supposed to answer that crazy question. The most popular one that's cited pretty often, has books about it and all sorts of things, is what is the sound of one hand clapping? Another one that gets cited all the time is if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does the tree make a sound? That one gets put in like, uh, I don't know, articles and stuff about koans all the time. As far as I know, that's a later invention. It has nothing at all to do with koans. If we go to the handy Shambhala Dictionary of Buddhism in Zen, their definition of koans is as follows. In Zen, a koan is a phrase from a sutra or teaching on Zen realization, an episode from the life of an ancient master, a mondo, which is a conversation, whatever the source, each points to the nature of ultimate reality. Essentially, a koan is a paradox, that which is beyond thinking, which transcends the logical or conceptual. Thus, since it cannot be solved by reason, a koan is not a riddle. Solving a koan requires a leap to another level of comprehension. When I first got into this Zen stuff, my teacher was this guy named Tim McCarthy, who I've talked about here before. And he had studied both Rinzai Zen, which uses the koans, and Soto Zen. And he was ordained within the Soto style, which doesn't use the koans in quite the same way. We'll get to that. Once Tim was talking to me and he mentioned a koan that he'd heard from a Rinzai teacher, and the koan went like this. Where was that sound before you heard it? After you heard it, where did it go? And that story like stuck in my mind for a long, long time. Maybe because I'm a musician. I don't know if punk bass player qualifies as musician or not. And it had to do with sound. Maybe that's why. And years and years later, I was in Japan. I was at what they call a shine yoko, which is a company trip in which they take all the people who work at a company and take them somewhere far, far away to get drunk for a weekend and kind of bond together. Nobody else is allowed to come. If you're married, your spouse can't come. You know, no family members, no just people who work for the company all together at a hotel getting wasted. I was probably one of two or three sober people in the entire hotel. And I was talking to a friend of mine, this woman named uh, Umezaki Mayu. I was talking to her about Zen. I don't know why. I'm sure she was drunk, but I was not. And I was trying to tell her about this koan that I'd heard. And I translated it roughly into very bad Japanese, like, Sono oto kiku mae ni doku ni atta, soshite kiku ato de doku ni chatta. That's, I think that's how I translated it. Anybody who can speak Japanese knows that that's a terrible translation, but probably vaguely understandable. And as I was telling her this, it suddenly occurred to me, ah, I know the answer to this koan. And I said to her in Japanese, because she didn't speak English, I know the answer. I just figured it out. Do you want to hear it? And she probably didn't care about it at all at this point, but she said yes. So I poked her, like in the shoulder. I said, that's the answer. And she's just going, what? But that was the answer. Uh, it made it made perfect sense to me at the time, and, and it still makes perfect sense to me. But it's very difficult to explain exactly why that's the answer, and that's probably the crux of understanding what the koan practice is all about, because the answer is, is at once extraordinarily clear and impossible to explain. And I remember asking Tim, like, well, does everybody give the same answer to the koans? And he said, yes. And I'm like, well, that's impossible, because they, they're, how could... You know, all these people who never met each other give the same answer to these crazy questions. But he insisted that they do give the same answer. My understanding of that now, having answered that one and kind of come up with answers for some of the others, is it's not like a riddle. It's not like what's black and white and red all over and the answer is a newspaper. It's not that kind of an answer. But when people recognize that they are 
coming together in a kind of common understanding about this intuitive nature of reality, they can pass a conversation between each other that might be incomprehensible to most people, but at the same time it makes perfect logical sense. The Buddhist way of understanding the universe is that we are not actually individuals. We are cooperative units of a single something that includes all of us, but also includes a lot more underneath the individualness of us. Another question that arises often that is the one that kind of baffles me is whether or not Dogen taught people to do this kind of koan practice, this so-called koan introspection practice. And the answer is no, he didn't. And the evidence for this is abundantly clear. One of Dogen's most famous pieces of writing is a thing called Fukan Zazengi, which is often translated as recommending Zazen to all people. In that, he gives detailed instructions for how to do Zazen, and he never talks about getting a koan from your teacher and holding on to it during Zazen and answering that koan during a private interview with the teacher. When I've described koan practice in some of my books and online stuff, there have been people who've complained that what I've described is a parody of koan practice. And what I'm describing is based on a couple of sources. One is this book, The Sound of One Hand, 261 Zen Koans with Answers, that I found in the late lamented Bodhi Tree bookstore. Uh, here's what it says about the answers to certain koans. One of the most famous is, a monk asked Master Joshu, does a dog have Buddha nature? Joshu said, mu, i.e. no non-existence or no thing. Uh, the answers they give here are, sitting erect in front of his master, the pupil yells, mu, with all his might. And then the master will say, when you don't say mu, what do you say? The pupil yells, u, which is the opposite of mu, meaning is or existence. The master says, distinguish between mu and u. The pupil separately yells, mu, u. How far away is mu from u? From where he sits in the room, the pupil points to objects, for instance, the threshold or door, and says, from here to the threshold and is so and so many feet, up to that door is so and so many feet. And it goes on and on with a bunch of other answers. When I lived at the Hill Street Center, which is a meditation center in Santa Monica, it was not my center. A lot of people thought the Hill Street Center was my thing. It wasn't. A lot of other groups used it. And I remember one time being in my room uh, trying to read a book or something. And in the next room, I could hear people going, ooh, moo, moo. Really made it hard to read that book. So when people say that my characterization of the koan introspection practice is a parody, and that this doesn't exist, it does exist, and it is done that way. It may not be done that way everywhere, but certainly the practice of going moo as a way to try to demonstrate your zenness does exist. That's koan introspection practice. If that's what he did as his zazen, why doesn't he mention it? Another piece of evidence can be found in Shobogenzo, in this case in Nishijima Roshi's translation, book four. In Kazuaki Tanahashi's translation, it appears in book two. And the passage in question is called Jisho Zammai, Samadhi as Experience of the Self. Or in the Kazuaki Tanahashi translation, it's called Self Realization Samadhi. In this chapter, Dogen goes on one of the greatest disses of his career against a guy he identifies as Soko, Zen Master Dai of Kinzan Mountain. In the Kazuaki Tanahashi translation, he's called Zonggao, Zen Master Dahui of Mount Jing, because they use the Chinese transliterations. He's also called Tahui. Now, if you go and look up Tahui on the usually mostly reliable Wikipedia, here's what it says. Dahui Zonggao, 1289 to 1163. Dahui introduced the practice of Kan Huato, 
or inspecting the critical phrase of a koan story. This method was called the Chan of Gongan or koan introspection. And he believed koans were the best way to achieve enlightenment. Dogen's writings about Tahui or Dahui or Zonggao, however you want to say his name, are epic. You know the thing that Eminem did when he dissed Donald Trump? It's kind of like one of those things. He just kind of goes on and on about everything that's wrong with uh, Dahui and dismisses him entirely as completely unreliable. Now, he doesn't specifically mention koan introspection practice in the piece of writing, but it's clear that that is among the many things he is referring to that Dahui got wrong. And if you want more, there is a passage in Shobo Genzo's We Monkey, which was compiled by Dogen's student Eijo, and it says, Although the koan wato seems to improve one's understanding slightly, it actually leads further and further from the way of the Buddhas and patriarchs. So he's pretty clear about this. Now, I'm not one of those people who says, Dogen said it, I believe it, that settles it. Dogen could have been wrong about whether koans were a good way to practice Zen or not. That's beside the point. The point is that it's impossible to defend the idea that Dogen did this kind of practice because he is abundantly clear that he did not. So it baffles me that there's a whole group of people out there, and one of them just popped up on the internet a week or two ago, uh, who, who try to claim that he did this. Uh, he didn't. Uh, I mean, whether, whether you do it or not, and whether you think it's right or not, that's beside the point. But trying to read it into Dogen is ridiculous. So why? Why do you do that? I don't understand that. As to that idea that koans are illogical statements or meant to transcend logic, Dogen is pretty adamantly against that idea as well. And here's what he says. In Great Sung China today, there is a group of scatterbrained people who are so numerous that they cannot possibly be overcome by the minority of authentic practitioners. They maintain phrases such as the East Mountain walks on water are incomprehensible utterances. The idea is that a word or phrase involving thought could not be one of the Zen sayings of the Buddhas and patriarchs, for only incomprehensible utterances are the sayings of Buddhas and patriarchs. Those who utter such nonsense have not yet met a true master and lack the eye or insight of proper study. They are fools not worthy of mention. So. Dogen also rejected this idea that koans were incomprehensible. What my teacher Nishijima Roshi used to say was that koans point the way to a different sort of logic. It is logical, but it's a logic that we are generally not familiar with. It's, it's not the kind of logic we learn in school when we learn, uh, what is it, Aristotelian logic and things like that. It's a logic that goes beyond that, but it's not illogic. It's, it's a different sort of logic. The logic of my answer made perfect sense to me and was not some kind of transcendent experience into a new reality, but into seeing logic in a different way. When I told Nishijima Roshi about that experience that I'd had at the Shine Ryoko, the company trip, he listened to my answer and he said, hmm, that is a good answer to the koan. But another answer would be, before you snapped your fingers, there was no sound. When you snapped your fingers, there was sound. After you snapped your fingers, there was no sound again. And I thought, okay, that sounds like a good answer too. So that's koans in a nutshell. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to donate to this page, that's how I make my living and buy all these books at used bookstores. The links are below to my Patreon page and a PayPal donation button thing that you can donate on PayPal. Thanks a lot for your contributions. Every little bit helps. See you next time.